the marinade. There's no O in marinade. Let's try it one more time. Ready? One, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> the marinade. <laughs> marrow. Marrow. Marinade. Marrow. Bone marinade. The marinade. The marinade. With Jason Earl. Welcome to The Marinade with Jason Earl, a free-flowing conversation about the creative process with creative people. This is episode 116, and our guest is Elizabeth Moen. Elizabeth is a singer and songwriter whose latest record, Wherever You Aren't, will be released on November 11th, 2022. Elizabeth is smart and thoughtful and is a talented songwriter. Y'all, this is the kind of record that grabs you on the first listen and doesn't let go. We caught up with Elizabeth via Zoom while she was on tour singing in Kevin Morby's band. We talk about that experience. We talk about the making of her outstanding new record, growing up in small town Iowa, and just so much more. Everyone, this was such a pleasure. My conversation with Elizabeth Mullen. Hey, y'all, before we get to the show, I want to give a huge shout out to our new Patreon patrons. In the couple of months since we last had an episode, we have had four folks join the Patreon. Timothy, thank you so much. Jordan, thank you so much. Rambler Kane, thank you so much. Gary, thank you so much for joining the Patreon. Folks, patreon.com slash marinade podcast is a way you can support the show financially if you're able. If not, we totally get it. But just know that every little bit goes a long way. So if you can swing it, we'd love to have you over there. It's also a bit of a community that we have where we uh, share ideas about music. I typically post uh, what guests are upcoming. And then our show, Jason's Journey, where I talk about the moments that shape my creative life. I had a really interesting experience at Spirit of the Swanee Music Park recently that had my head in knots. And so I reached out to our Patreon community for some feedback on that whole experience and and shared some of the things I was going through. So that's the kind of thing we do over there on Patreon. Thanks again, Timothy, Jordan, Rambler, Kane, and Well, short mic stand or not, shitty mic stand or not, thank you for being here. I'm so excited to talk with you. I've been listening to your record uh, over and over and over again, and I'm so excited for folks to get to to hear it coming up in just a few weeks. And uh, it's just wonderful. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, I can't wait to dive into it and get a chance to talk to you. So just thank you so much for for doing this. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, if my internet ever, fe- if it's ever cutting in or out a little bit let me know um okay i I, i'm at a hotel in jacksonville florida oh Um, no way we have a day off um on tour today so yeah just hanging out in the hotel room and uh yeah it's hit or miss so you just Uh, you just let me know are you wait are you playing with kevin morby tomorrow yeah i'm in his band for the fall 
Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I actually reached out to his people like a week ago or something. Cause I think his record is just perfect. And it's been it's amazing. Maybe my favorite record of the year. And I live in Orlando. So I was going to, I was hoping to shoot up there to Jacksonville, get a chance to interview him and catch the show. I haven't heard back from them, but that's still like on the back in the back of my mind, hoping to make happen. Cause I, that's awesome that you're playing with him. Yeah, I could definitely list you. I know he's okay, especially on like the, the like. So I've I've been in his band for like the last few runs of shows. Like for this, like this is a photograph, um, like tour, uh-huh. and just because of like COVID stuff, like he hasn't really been doing. Mm. He's been doing very limited in person interviews. Okay, so I could put you on the list. I unfortunately can't guarantee an interview, but I could at least right. Put you on the list. I would be grateful. That would be very, very cool. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I've I've had that that date circled on my and I love it. The shows at Intuition are so fun because they're just real. They're I, there's like a real chillness to them. It's just a comfortable space, I think. And mm-hmm. um, Jacksonville is my favorite city on the planet. I know you probably never heard anybody say that, but uh, I lived there off and on for a decade, and I just absolutely adore it. And so any chance I get to come back, and I actually have tomorrow evening where I could do that. So thank you. That would be awesome. It would be cool to catch your set and actually maybe even meet you in person. That would be great. Yeah, I'll be I'll be playing a lot of tambourine tomorrow. <laughs> okay, all right. My, no, I'm kidding. No, I, I uh, <laughs> no, it's been fun um, doing that. Uh, if anything, it's it's been a good, like, learning experience like it's my first time being like a hired gun as like a backup vocalist okay and also just like with the anxiety and stress around releasing a record it's like I've been so busy with being on this tour that I haven't really conveniently not had the time to be like anxious about releasing my record because that's great right I mean it's a nice feeling Oh. oh yeah so avoidance is great. <laughs> uh, I think my therapist would have something to say about that, but it, the, yeah. <laughs> the, okay. So I didn't, I, I, I did not realize that I knew that you were, I guess I knew you at some point had toured with Kevin. I did not realize that you were playing in his band that that's really exciting. So what, how do you approach you mentioned a little bit of that sort of avoidance and how it's a nice distraction. How, how different is the sort of the, the work in terms of creativity and your energy when you're playing in somebody's band in, in this case, and you said, this is your first time kind of doing this particular thing versus when it's your whole, when it's your own thing, how do you approach those things? Yeah, I'm taking this little, this, this mic stand is dumb. Okay. <laughs> um, we have established the mic stand is dumb. You, you need your money back. You deserve your money back. I really do. It's so dumb. Um, Yeah, I, I think it, it's a completely different experience. It's like the creativity when you're, you know, making your own songs and like playing your own songs. It's like, it's it's all just like whatever your brain is like wanting to do and then when you're in someone else's band the creative part is like you figure out what can you do best for the song like how can you add to the song like not being too much not being too little um i guess figuring out where it's appropriate to add your own little flair cuz inevitably when you're hiring you know different instrumentalists or singers to be a part of the live version of your record it's going to sound different if you have different people playing they like I guess one thing I really like about and, and that I look up to Kevin for is like he wants you to like play or sing like yourself but still like honor the song mm. so if I, so as as the singer who is supposed to do that the creativity comes in the in in the finding uh, like in finding a balance of like how can i make sure i'm staying in the lane of the record but not trying to sound like someone else mm. um yeah is okay so then when you as when it's your project are you communicating a similar thing to people playing with you or are you 
or do you have a more specific vision that you want executed? Oh, it's, it's always like free reign. I basically just send the chord charts and the songs to like bandmates, like new bandmates, old bandmates, whatever. I'll send a set list with the chord charts and then I'll be like, all right, this song on the record, there's a saxophone solo. This show, we don't have a saxophone. Lead guitar, you take the solo. Mm. You do you. I, I, I think finding musicians who you trust is so important. When you mm. can trust them to like do their homework, do a good job, and do that thing where it's the balance of like, I know you're going to bring yourself to the table, but you're also going to like honor the original version of the song. But I think when songs sound exactly like the record or perfect live, I think it's really boring. Mm -hmm. So I, I always try and um, make the live performance of my songs. Yeah, more... I don't know, something that whoever comes to that show, they're going to get that experience and no one else will if they didn't come to the show. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love that. How, you mentioned trust. How, how, how easy is it for you to trust, a spe specifically in the creative process? How easy is it for you to trust people with your songs? When someone gives off a trustworthy energy it's so easy I, and that's what i mean anyone i've ever you know had hop on my music whether it's like recording it or being a part of the live aspect or um i mean now i like the last year or so i've been getting into like songwriting collaborations mm. when you're like creating with someone else and you just you know that what you're like there's like the symbiotic thing mm -hmm. and it's very fluid it's i'd say it's very easy mm. um but it's not easy when it's someone that you aren't clicking with or connecting with um which is why i always end up like i guess th this is what happens for most people but like i always hire my friends Mm -hmm. or I end up hiring someone where it's like a friend of a friend, but we really vibe. And then I'm like, all right, you're, you're in the back of my mind to play bass. If ever I need like a sub bass player, I know that we're clicking. I know you're good. Mm. I'm going to hit you up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think it sounds like there's just a lot of uh, intuition that's involved in terms, no pun intended, you're playing intuition tomorrow. The um, there's there's a certain I intuitiveness to to the way you're approaching a collaboration. Has that have you always had that sort of natural like intuition about people? Um, is that something that was cultivated at a young age? Is that something that's specific to music, or is that just sort of something that's a part of who you are? I think it it's a some it's something that is a part of who I am <laughs> that I'm through music in the last you know handful of years I've really honed in and like really looked at that and been like oh like you know since I was a kid I've been pretty good at picking up vibes and I think you mm. know that comes just naturally it also comes from like I mean trauma you know, mm. like what, like in your childhood when like you're around people where you have to be very perceptive of like other energies or mm. other like emotions, mm -hmm. it, you know, it for better and sometimes for worse, it makes you very hyper aware. Mm. Um, but the positive part of that is like, yeah, you just, you can really pick up vibes and I mean, most musicians have a great vibe. I mean, we're all just wanting to connect and we want to create. And when there's a sincerity to it, like where it's not just about like money or networking or all that bullshit, it's mm. most people you meet 
are are gonna be you know i at least for me like pretty easy to connect with or like i think most if not okay not everyone but most people <laughs> are good are, are good people deep down and if you really <laughs> look at them you can you can sense that i like that i'm glad that's been your experience i i think from from me my interaction with the music industry and with musicians is mostly this kind of interaction. And so it, it's very, um, I sort of have everything at an arm's length. And um, so when I hear kind of horror stories about the music industry or about particular musicians or whatever, I'm like, that has never, almost never been my experience. Everybody that I've got a chance to interview 115 episodes in folks I know who are songwriters and players are all just, great energy like you're talking about but I, it's good to hear you say that because i i will say that i hear a lot from women in the industry that they don't always get that kind of it have that kind of experience so it's really encouraging to hear you say that yeah well there are plenty of um plenty of creeps there are plenty of mm. um you know plenty of like men in the industry who don't really look at women in the industry or otherwise like as mm. equals or individuals uh, absolutely but i guess those just aren't the people that i work with mm. like i don't i don't waste my if i pick up a vibe from especially from a man in the industry where it's like oh i can tell you don't you aren't really seeing me as a person right now and if I pick up that energy, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to play a show with you. I'm not going to hire you to be in my right. band. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I've had some, I mean, I've, I've had some, some dudes like hit me up to be like, Hey, we should like collaborate on a song or something. And I'll very respectfully say no, because it's like, eh, I'm picking up a vibe. I've also heard some stuff. Mm. I think communication is really important. Um, like when you, if, if, if you hear something, it's like, all right, well, keep that in mind. Um, yeah. but yeah, I just, I just don't, I just don't work with assholes. I guess <laughs> that's, that's my, that's my one rule. Don't be an asshole. What a great rule though. Right. Like I, and what, a, what, a, what a simple, but great rule. I'm just not going to work with assholes. <laughs> it's yeah. I don't, it's. <laughs> uh yeah but i i think yeah i don't know yeah. I, I was gonna try and say something profound but it i can't think of no I, you, you've i'm said, not even gonna i'm not gonna try <laughs> you said plenty it's very it's all helpful so thank you i i want to back up i want to talk about um there was actually a twitter thread that some that just like fortuitously i guess i ended up in the middle of about musicians from iowa that like Twitter's the best place on earth. I, I know people get, I want to be critical, but like I ended up in the middle of a thread about musicians from Iowa. Come on. I got a chance to, I got a chance to shout out your record in this Twitter thread. It was wonderful. Um, but what's interesting about like Iowa is that for, I think for a lot of us outside of the state, it's like this, this black hole or something where like, I can't, I've never been there. I've never, I've tried, I've actually tried to get there. Like it's it, it because it's there's never a reason to necessarily go to Iowa for me. I don't have family there. I don't have like any connection. So I've like tried to find a show to go to, a festival to cover, like something like that, just for a reason to go see it and experience it. And so I, I, I while recognizing my own ignorance about it, I'm curious what in terms of your creative process and of nurturing you as a songwriter what growing up in Iowa was like it, um, as it relates to sort of your evolution as a songwriter? Well, you know what? Iowa's great. If you have an excuse, go. If you don't nice. have an excuse, I don't know, don't go. But uh, it's, I think I didn't really start songwriting until the end of college. I went to college in Iowa as well. But growing up in a town of like less than a thousand people, in the middle kind of like of nowhere mm -hmm. and not really 
there, there just weren't groups or like people to like jam with or connect with or like I never really had the opportunity to like go to shows you know or be a part of like you know shows and like I was in musical theater and shit but like you know like indie rock shows um is there was like a loneliness to being um a little like I guess I never really tapped into that kind of creativity because I just didn't have the like community to do it with mm. um but I did tap into like you know being super isolated and alone especially in the summer like when it, you know before I had a car like being just like all right I'm isolated what do I do to like not be bored yeah. um and yeah, I think tapping into like those feelings, you know, at a young age. And also um, I started, I, t I taught myself guitar and I think like learning guitar um, was very like therapeutic for me as like a teenager. Um, mm. And I think Iowa, it's, it's a beautiful landscape. The winters are very intense and very like, you're hitting all the seasons. It's a very like poetic place. Hmm. Like with, with the weather and the scenery, it's like, sometimes it's, it's like, hmm. you know, very like green and beautiful. And sometimes it's just very like empty. And so there's all of this space where you can really like think. Um, and in Iowa city, there's a, the writer's workshop, which is the best like grad program for poetry and fiction writing. Mm. And I mean, there's a reason why it's in Iowa. It's like, there, there's this like very like, it's like stoic, pensive, like ruggedness to Iowa sometimes, especially in the winter. And I think that's why a lot of those writers end up, you know, doing a lot of good stuff in Iowa, like particularly Iowa city. And my senior year, I befriended my friend McGurk, who was a poet in the writer's workshop at the time. And, you know, I had so many, you know, I was singing a lot of cover songs at like open mics and a lot of my friends, including McGurk and then some other people in the writer's workshop, they were like, why don't you write your own songs? And I was like, well, I have a lot of guitar stuff, but I can't write lyrics. I feel like I I just, I wouldn't be good at it or I would be too cheesy. And they were just like, I didn't think I could be a poet. And now mm -hmm. here I am, you know, at the best grad program in the world for poetry. So it's mm -hmm. like, all, it, it's just letting go of that, you know, fear of failure or, um, that, you know, negative part of being self-conscious of like, you know, just think overthinking how you're being perceived, that kind of thing. Um, mm. and then one night, uh, McGurk came over and we drank some beers and she gave me a poetry lesson. And that poetry lesson really helped me tap in to all of the, like, to creating lyrically and um it was like I always had it in me I think even as a kid you know being in that like in nature and in that loneliness like finally having these tools and the door open to like write it just shat out and like mm. I've been writing pretty nonstop ever since um so yeah very long story short I think Iowa is just one of the best places to write and it's it's kind of a little secret but then it's not I guess in terms of like the poetry world or the you know like the world of books in general mm -hmm. um but I mean some of the like Arthur Russell is from Iowa he's one of he's a very big influence um to me like I we don't have similar music but like I I remember hearing his music and being just like really smitten by it 
and he has so many different albums with different sounds and like songwriting styles and different instruments and I was like wow but god this guy is so cool and then I looked him up and I found out that he was from Iowa and I was like oh shit and it like I was like wow a, one of the greats is also is like he's from Iowa and there are a lot of modern Iowa musicians as well who are just awesome there a lot of people don't know about them you know it's a flyover state it's very looked over but you know we we got arthur russell so everyone (laughs) (laughs) nathan bell's father is was a professor there in that program at iowa too do you know the songwriter nathan bell no he's from there he's incredible um Yeah, his father, I wish I could remember his father's name right off the top of my head, but his father was a very Kurt accomplished. Kurt Vonnegut. Father. Kurt Vonnegut, yep. Kurt mm-hmm. Vonnegut, uh-huh. He did go to the workshop. Uh, yeah. Uh-uh. <laughs> um, so, okay, this is all wonderful. Thank you for that thoughtful response. There's a lot, of, a lot that has come out of that that makes me want to kind of take the discussion of place a little bit further. It, so as I understand your record, wherever you aren't the it sort of came together it seems um kind of all over the place it 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 is very clearly a cohesive work and i think that's really interesting too is that it is this cohesive work but can you talk a little bit about like the process of getting to that cohesive work as you're as it seems like as i'm reading that you're sort of traveling around and and recording in different places and writing in different places and So I guess what I'm curious about is like what that looked like and then also how much place as you sort of outlined in talking about Iowa, how much place influences the way that you write. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah. So I right after college, just on a like I studied abroad in France when I was a teenager and. I graduated a semester late, so in the winter, and my graduation gift was a plane ticket back to France so I could see my old friends and stay with them. Cool. But one of the jobs I was working at, um, I was bartending at at a burger place, and this Irish guy would come sit at the bar, and he was like, you have to go to Dublin before you go to France. Like, you could stay at my sister's place. Um... But it's like it's like the Nashville of Europe. You should you should go. It's like songwriting central. And I was like, oh, cool. So I took him up on that and I ended up at an open mic. And I didn't have like a guitar with me, but they were like, if you wait till the end, like 1.30 a.m., we'll let you sing a song. I was like, okay. So I stayed there all night just chatting and listening to music and making friends. And then I played the song and some people there were like, oh my God, like you should stay. So then I stayed an extra week on couches. And then these people were like, if you came back, you could stay with us. So then I went back to Iowa, played around the Midwest, had a terrible breakup, was like, all right, I'm going back to, I'm taking them up on this offer. Sublet my place, went back to Ireland. And then I befriended um, through those three months some friends who were like, whoa, if you came back, I would play bass with you. I would play drums with you. I was like, oh, cool. Next time I'll have like a band. So then I went back to America. I did my first like tour around like the States or or, yeah, like on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Stayed with some friends over there. Befriended some instrumentalists on the West Coast who were like, hey, if you if you came back, we'd play with you. And I was like, "Okay, cool. Went back to Ireland. And then I had this like brand new song idea, which was headgear. And I was like, hey, I know we're going to play some of my songs that like we I've already like recorded, but I have this new song and it it feels really special to me. Could we just try it out at rehearsal? And then we tried it out and it. It just felt. it, It felt right. And I was like, I'm so glad that I'm you know, 
rec- like creating, like finishing the the creation of the song with this band. Mm. It just felt right. And then we recorded it there before I left at Hellfire Studios, um, a little outside of Dublin. And then I came back and I did a Kickstarter for the record for like the like recording process of it. And I just was writing a lot where, where, when I go to the West coast, when I go to New York, when I crash on couches in the Midwest or Ireland or France or Italy, just like all of these different places, I was connecting with people and I would just write these songs. And then with various friends and bandmates, I would record the songs or like finish writing the song. Um, and yeah, I think that the whole record, thanks for thinking it's cohesive. I don't think it's cohesive because uh, it's really just a hodgepodge of like songs over the course of three years of me. Th- they were just my favorite songs out of the like 50 plus songs I had written. Those were the ones where I was like, damn, if I had the money to record these right, I could make these sound really good. Hmm. Do they all make sense together? I guess in a way, but it's not like a concept album by any means. It's really just like 10 songs that I was like, I, th- I think these are good. That's so interesting because when I first listened, so just my, my initial, usually when I approach a record, you know, uh, like this, it, it, I, I'm listening to it one time through and if it grabs me, um, then I do a, a deeper dive. Right. And then I end up with a record like this that I really, really like, I end up listening to it over and over again. So that's kind of how this has, has happened for me. And the first listen, I was like, that is just smooth top to bottom, smooth, beautiful record. I picked up on a, a few things that kind of hit me a little bit harder than others, but for the most part, I was just like, God, that's just smooth. It reminds me of something Cat Clyde would make. It reminds me of like, um, a Lake street dive record. Like there's all these, these things that I love that it's, that it reminds me of. It's not the same thing. It just reminds me of. And then the second time through, um, oh, if this thing ends, then, uh, I'll just start it back up. Cause we're, uh, DIY over here. So we don't pay for zoom. Um, so the, uh, when I listened to it, the, the second time, um, I started to hear little bits that I was kind of attaching to. And then when I did a deep dive on it, I realized some of these songs have like lyrics on top of lyrics on top of lyrics. I mean, there, there's a lot, there's uh, like a song, like where's my bike is uh, got a lot of words. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then there's a song like uh, soft serve. That's just, there's, it's not wordy, right. It's, there's a whole lot more of a different feel to it. But when they when they're together, it all sounds like it flows perfectly. And I I'm really interested in a couple of moments. Like, for example, on um, I believe it's on. Yep. It's on Where's My Bike, which is maybe my favorite song on the record. The there's a lyric that says, I'm sick of singing songs about my exes. And the very next fucking song is called Ex's House Party. And I just thought that was <laughs> beautiful. And I, I just was like. <laughs> just i love that so much you know and just uh so it feels like there's very um intentional choices and maybe those intentional choices just came after you were like all right i got these 50 songs and i'm gonna narrow it down to a record and they just sort of fit but it fits it's a smooth transition from song to song it's a a beautiful record top to bottom i think it's wonderful thank you um yeah that that song is like so after that line, I'm sick of singing songs about my exes should join somebody else's band, sing songs about their life instead of mine, yeah. be a part of a very marketable brand. That particular verse has been hitting me hard the last, you know, five months. Cause that's what I've been doing. I was like, you know what? Like, I mean, that's yeah. Like being, being in this, uh, in this band, it's been so fun and cool. it's, it's really silly to like actualize a line in a song. Cause when I had written that, I was like, Oh, ha ha ha. I should just like quit doing my own thing and just be in somebody else's band, but I'll never do that. Yeah. 
and then like fast forward like four or five years later because all these songs are pretty old um Mm. because i've been sitting on this record for like a few years uh it's just funny to like to you know that's what i'm doing but i also i love it and i think finding the balance of doing both is really fulfilling well, mm-hmm. I like how it's like to follow that theme in the very next line after that is, or I could keep wallow, wallowing all afternoon, only think about my own problems. And we started this conversation by talking about how you're, you're playing in this band and it's distracting you from all, uh, from, from like life, <laughs> you know, you don't have to worry about your own shit. You can, 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 uh, you know, be a part of somebody else's shit. I love it. It's, that's so great. Art imitating life, imitating art. I love it. Well, thanks. <laughs> There's another really great lyric in um, "Where's My Bike" uh, that that hit me really, really hard, and it is. And I'm glad my mom doesn't listen to this. My mom calls to ask about my week. I can tell it's a trap. Oof, yeah, my parents didn't love that line. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> but it was. It's a joke. It's. A, it's my. My family is very, very silly, uh, or like we love we love to shoot the shit. We love to poke fun. Mm. We love to like. I think humor is really important, um, and so they know. Like I'm just I'm, you know I'm just joking around. I'm uh, the rest of the song. I'm just making fun of myself. Like it's <laughs> it's like I'll, I'll make fun of anything. I'll make fun of. Um, but yeah, initially they were not loving that song, um, but now they think it's funny. Um, but I'm guilty. I mean, we're all guilty of that. Like, hell yeah, you know, it's like yeah, hitting someone up because the, the, the you really want to like, oh, like let's just have a quick chat. But it's like, no, you want to talk for an hour, don't you? Yeah. Or like, <laughs> or like I don't know, weaseling certain topics into a conversation, like. Yeah. We're all guilty of that. Yeah. Maybe some more than others, but like, yeah. Well, it's funny how we, we don't, I mean, I think it goes down easier, right? If, if you start off with something else and then, and then you, you go into the heavier thing or the, or the, the actual motive of your conversation. Cause, but I, it's, I, cause I think we all get kind of defensive. Otherwise, sometimes you don't get that authentic response from someone. If you're just like up front, here's the thing I need to talk about let's discuss this. Uh, I've learned a lot about that from my partner. She's the master at like e- easing into something that's going to be a, a serious conversation, Heavy. not just in our relationship, but like I see mm-hmm. her do it with other people, you know? That's great. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's a, that's how to healthily communicate. And also like when I was right, that the whole song is about admitting you're in a bad place or mm-hmm. realizing like, oh my God, I'm having panic attacks. Oh my God, I'm living in my parents' guest room again. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I'm making no money. Oh my God, like- I got this long to-do list. Yeah, I think that I'm not gonna fucking do. I've got like, you know, like I wanna hit people up, but I think they hate me. And it's like, do they? Probably not. You're just like being too self-critical. So it's like, when I'm saying my, it's a trap that my mom's calling me, that person writing that song is like in such a negative headspace that like mm-hmm. their mom calling out of care to see how they're doing because they're living on her in her fucking guest room mm-hmm. it's a trap where it's like no maybe it is kind of a trap but it's also like your mom's worried about you mm-hmm. you know like maybe it's a trap to check in because you're really hard to check in with. You know? <laughs> maybe you need to be like, trapped. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Maybe your mom just, I don't know, <laughs> loves you or something. <laughs> right, 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 right. That's funny. Yeah, yes. I can relate to it so much. I, and I think that song, because I, I that everything you just said, I I, I got from that song. And it's it, the, it feels a little more um, clearly laying out, this is what this song, it, this is how this song is, is to be taken. Whereas there are some songs like I'm not sure what to make of soft serve. I mean, I think it's beautiful, but like, I'm not sure what, if anything you're trying to say, or if it's just that I'm 
you know, I need to interpret whatever I need from that song. And I think that's really interesting on this record too, is that there are some songs that feel like they're just sort of going, this is the thing I need to say right now. You know, my mom's calling to trap. And then there are some songs that are sort of like, like soft serve, for example, that I'm kind of like, man, I could project a lot of stuff onto this. You know, I could project a lot of different experiences and situations onto this. And so I'm wondering if like you think about that as you're writing, like, are, are, are do you, approach some songs to be a little more literal and others to be a little bit more left up to interpretation yeah I, I never it's never intentional how vague or specific a thing's gonna be but um or at least not yet I think I want to tap into like more intention with songwriting for the next record um or like do a concept or what the fuck ever but uh mm -hmm. Yeah, this like soft serve is just straight up like a cheesy summertime love song of like any age, but it's just like like the the, the only line that or, or like not the only line, but there the, the end of the song is from June to May, I hope you'll stay next to me. Like it's just like it, it's it's just like this like intentionally cheesy like june to may it's like okay so all year round <laughs> so you want me to eat ice cream with you all year round like that's yeah like it's it's not heady it's not heavy it's just like i think a lot of the songs on the record are about like you know sad shit whether it's like introspective stuff or it's like breakup stuff mm -hmm. so this song is like an homage to like the pre breakup of like, Oh wow. This is what it feels like when you're actually falling in love. Mm -hmm. This, this song is what happened in order for the bulk of the rest of the album, which is like, damn, how do I get over this person who made me feel like soft serve? Mm -hmm. Like, damn, I felt this way. And now I'm feeling like, like wherever you aren't like, that's like, the marinade. So uh, what you were saying just before we got cut off there, because I, I'm too cheap to pay for Zoom, I feel like it's proving, uh, uh, this is an opportunity to plug the Patreon. Everybody join my Patreon so I can pay for Zoom. The um, It's proven my point about how cohesive the record is. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I like made maybe there were some things that weren't intentional, but it's not, I mean, that sound feels very intentional, right? Like what you just told me about those, about that song versus some of the other songs feels like very, it adds to the cohesion of it. Well, thanks. Yeah. yeah. There's a wide array of feelings and like experiences in the timeline of I mean, your 20s, a lot. I mean, this is all written in my mid-20s. Mm. Um, and also, like, in a mm. relationship. Uh, it's like, so, some of the songs are also, like, there's, like, the lovey-dovey thing. There's also the, like, pre-breakup thing, like, differently is, like, the, the, one of the main lines in the song is, like, I, oh, God. Am I gonna butcher my own lyrics? Um, I haven't pulled up. I can help you out. I've never, I've never said I'm losing what is worth the work to me. Mm. Like with this particular breakup, it was the first time where I was like, "Wow, this feels really real," and like it's worth this work. Like I don't want the, I don't want to break up. I want, I want to try and like work through this. Obviously, it didn't work out. Um, yeah. But then, like something like, you know, wherever you aren't, it's like you know, and you know, I know where it's like time has passed, but it's like, I know that communicating it's so post breakup where it's like, I can't, it's not healthy to see you. It's mm -hmm. okay to like smile and leave, but like, we don't need to talk. That's gonna, mm -hmm. that that's not the kind of post breakup uh, relationship we can have. I think some, some relationships you can have very, healthy friendships after mm -hmm. it if you take time and like it, it is like 
it makes sense. But some breakups, it's like, no, I think if mm-hmm. you're going to, if you're going to push communication or push a friendship, it's just going to always be toxic because of the way the relationship was or whatever. Um, and then this, I think to me, the best, not, well, maybe the best song lyrically on the record is clown song. And that song is about like post breakup, post breakup, post breakup, where it's like, wow, holding, holding yourself a little accountable of like, I'm putting on these airs to try and just impress someone and try and like prove that I'm worthy of love. Mm. Like the, 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 there's a line in the song of, and the rest of my bag of tricks to find a love that sticks has a hole in the bottom and doesn't even zip. And I think we're all a little guilty of like, you know, that honeymoon phase of like showing your best self, but some of that isn't necessarily true. And, um, so that song is just like really turning around. And then the whole song is like, um, I was so bent on your smile, never turned to see the storm. Like I was so focused on like impressing people that I didn't turn around to realize like, oh, there's some real shit I need to work on. Mm-hmm. So moving forward in the next relationship or the next friendship or just moving on in life in general, um, you know, like working on yourself, you know, Mm -hmm. and you know, like I wrote that song a little bit after I started going to therapy for the first time, which is huge. I think therapy is amazing for healthy, um, and productive self, um, reflection, Mm -hmm. you know, it actually helps you grow. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where that song came from. And my friend McGurk actually is a co co write with her. We worked on the lyrics together. She loves like the clowns and the circus. <laughs> and so I wrote I wrote this song and then I was like, mm, I feel like I feel like McGurk would be a good person to talk through this song with. Cause not only is she like a best friend, so you know, this song is very personal. So like I, I trust her again, trust, like I trust her yeah. to like really talk about you know, what the song's about, but we can also, you know, really lean into the theme of a clown. Mm -hmm. That's so great. And I I love that. I I love that you just pointed that particular part of the song, the rest of my bag of tricks to find a love that sticks has a hole in the bottom. It doesn't even zip. So great that, that, that work too. I mean, with relationships, you're doing that work on yourself ideally, but also what they don't tell you when you start a relationship, is that you're going to grow and they're going to grow and you may be together, but like the person you are eight years later is a different person than the one that was putting on that face or, or the one, even the one who was authentically projecting themselves, right? Like whoever I was eight year, eight and a half year, almost nine years ago now in my relationship, um, I'm different. I mean, not just the gray in my beard, but like, there's a lot of, of differences to, to who I am and to who she is, which is good, which is good, which is good. And you have to be aware of that, but also be able to adjust sort of expectations, adjust communication, make sure you're communicating all those things, because that's the thing I think, you know, as we start to, you have to continue to do that work on yourself. Right. Cause if you don't, it could be, it can be really easy to not put on sort of any face in, a, in other words not to put forth any not any effort but put forth the same effort that you made to be your best self or to project your best self once you get deep into a relationship and it's maybe even more important to be doing that you know five six seven eight years later or longer than it was at the beginning oh yeah it's well i think growing and changing and also like still like putting in effort is important in this like clown song has a little to do with that but it mostly has to do with like the things that aren't actually you that you're trying Mm. to be Mm. like the another line you know is like i it's a downpour and i've got water balloons they don't have the same effect they once did (laughs) and the rest of my bag of tricks to find a love that six has a whole blah 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 
but it's like you're trying to like prove something that's like what are you like what is the point of a water balloon when it's like raining or like what are you trying to do with this you know it's like it, it I, I at, at the time I'm definitely less this uh um like trying to be the cool girl, trying to be the chill girl at the beginning of a relationship. We're like, oh yeah, I'm cool with that. Yeah, I don't care. Mm. Yeah, I'm like really calm and cool. And like, I'm always like really just chill. And it's like, no, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. At all. Like, yeah. why am I pretending to be this little pick me girl? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, that's mm -hmm. not, it's not real. It's not going to work. It's not sustainable. Just be honest, be honest about your needs, be honest about who you are and what you can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I guess in general, uh, most of this record is just about all of the like hard lessons and growth that comes with being in your 20s. Mm -hmm. um, most of it's rough. Some of it like soft serve is really beautiful and special. But some mm -hmm. of it's like, you know, you look back and you're like, oh, my God, that sucks. I, yeah, I look back on my 20s and I just go like, yeah, I, man, I thought I had it together. And what a fucking mess I was like. And and the and the, the difference between 20 year old me and 29 year old me who still didn't have his shit together, but who was just a t getting there, <laughs> you know, starting to get there, like how different you are that that period of growth is wild. And I look back on some of the some of those things. And I'm like, what were you what was going on in your noodle? Like, what what were you doing, man? It's it is a really interesting thing to look back on, especially now in my 40s, to look back on on sort of who that guy was. And he's unrecognizable to this guy. That's and that and that's good to be yeah. like that's that's not me anymore. Or right. Like, and also like some it, it's good to be a little critical and be like, oh damn, what was I doing? Mm -hmm. And then also being a little gentle. I think looking uh looking back at these songs, aka like my, you know, early slash mid twenties, it's like, all right, you made some mistakes, but like you also, you know, you also did some hard work. Or like I can definitely sometimes think like, oh, those like, oh gosh, I wasn't that good of a songwriter then or like that song mm -hmm. isn't isn't good enough but then a couple days ago i went back to my master tracks just to give them a listen through and i was like wait no these songs are good these mm -hmm. these you know i you know three years i finished this record like three years ago and mm -hmm. i'm still like you know what these songs were good i was doing good stuff then and i need to not be so harsh on younger me because mm. she, she was mm -hmm. she was she she was doing good stuff yeah i love that and totally agree with you 100 percent um a couple couple other things i want to hit and then I'll, I'll let you go this has been so wonderful and thank you i i'm interested in you studied french you studied you, you lived in, in france you have a French version of at least one of your songs um, that's available on uh, Bandcamp. I think I saw it. And I'm interested in how your understanding of the French language informs your songwriting in English, if at all. Oh, yeah. Um, I think maybe not grammatically, you know, grammatically they're, they're pretty different languages, but, um, sometimes there are, you know, phrases in French or like the way you can, so, you know, different languages can express different kind of very specific feelings or like circumstances in a way that another language can't. And mm. I think understanding language helps you 
really understand lyricism or like the, you know, the process of writing, the more you understand a language, the better you can write. Hmm. And I think um, learning languages helps you write even better. Mm. Even if it is just in English, it's like, you know, learning Spanish definitely helped improve my French or like helped improve. I don't, I don't know. Like it's, it's all about communication. So I think the more you're tapping into like that communication part of your brain, mm. whether it, like if it's linguistics or language that will like still like work out that muscle, mm. which is the same muscle as like communicating through song. Mm. Wow. Awesome. Um, the, your Instagram suggests that you met Eddie Vedder. What was that like? <laughs> It was so sick. I, um, I don't know. This is what some people think. I don't, I don't know if it's true. Um, but I was backstage at this festival, his festival, and I was walking past him. Well, like I was walking past a group of people and then I looked up and I realized who it was and he like waved at me. And I just like smiled and waved back and kept walking. And then like an hour later, he was like standing alone and I was walking past him again to like go to this like area to like watch. Oh, St. Vincent. Um, oh, cool. Pink was right after her, but I, uh, he waved at me again. And so I was like, okay, he's standing alone. He just waved at me again. I should, I'm just going to go up. I usually don't like to go up to famous people mm. um, backstage at things. Cause like they get that too much. Yeah. Especially somebody not- that big. Yeah. They're not going to remember me. Who gives a shit? But then he was, I was like, hey. And he was like, hey, I, w- I waved at you earlier. I was like, I know. That's why I'm coming up to you. You know, you just waved again. And he was like, I've only said this once before in my life. I swear. But you feel like someone I know. Like, it really, like, I feel like I know you. And I was like, well, you don't. And I was like, well, you know, I did play. I, I played earlier. I was in, I was playing in someone's band. Maybe you know me from that. And he was like, what band? And I was like, Kevin Morby. And he was like, I missed that set. And I was like, okay, so that's not it. And I was like, I was like, well, I live in Chicago. Aren't you like a Chicago guy? And he was like, yeah, but it's not that. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, well, I work at a place called Chicago Music Exchange. We've covered some of your songs and they have a pretty big YouTube following. Maybe it's that. And he's like, no, it's not that. Just, it, you feel like it just, you have this energy. It just feels like I know you. And I was like, okay. And then he was like, you look a lot like this bartender at one of my, my family. We used to go to this one like sports bar called Stanley's and it was our, my family's favorite place. And you, you do kind of look like the, the like waitress who would like often serve us. And I was like, that definitely wasn't me, but thank you. And we chatted a bit and then the conversation was, you know, dying down and like St. Vincent was about to like, like she was like crushing it. And then I was like, well, I won't like, I'll, I'll like, I'll leave you be now, but like, could we get a pic? Like, could we get a picture? Like, I feel like it would like for my mom, like my mom would just be so ecstatic. And then we took a picture and then he hugged me and then he shook my hand and he put something in my hand and he was like, the photo is for your mom. This is for you. And I looked down and it was his lighter that he used while we were talking to light. Like he was lighting up um, I'm pretty sure it was joint and he was and then he like looked at me and was like do you want like during the conversation he's like do you want some as he was lighting it I was like no I'm good um COVID protocol you know ah, and, I, don't even, uh, I don't even smoke and I think I would have I would have said yes <laughs> to Eddie better and I don't either which is why I was like nah because if I get weird high <laughs> yeah, for the first yeah. time in years in front of Eddie better <laughs> yeah <laughs> but then yeah so then he gave me the lighter and then I walked away and I was like holy shit that was so cool and then I was like regaling the tale to the band and all of them were like yo we think Eddie Vedder was hitting on you and I was like no 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 and then I just like explained the story again and they were all like yes 
that's, it seems like that's what happened. I was like, no, I really don't think that's what happened. But I recently went through a little bit of a not so fun breakup. So I was like, you know what, if that was the case, I'm going to let that help me feel a little better. And be yeah. like, you know what? This, this one guy, this one, like just random dude who broke my heart. You know what? Have have fun with your little college girlfriend, and you better hit on me. <laughs> oh, that's so perfect! Oh my gosh! Well, I don't think there's anything else we could discuss that's going to top that story. That was wonderful. I'm so grateful for your time. This has been awesome. Um, I really appreciate it. What are you getting into in uh, Jacksonville tonight? Absolutely nothing. Okay. Um, we we've been really going at it. And today is like a day off where it's like, we really intentionally are trying to just rest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll probably, and it's also like kind of raining. So I'll mm. probably just work out the hotel, take it easy. I mean, did this, I have a bunch of emails. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, if you, uh, need suggestions, hit me up. Um, if you, eat at one place in town it'd be orsay it's kind of expensive but it's awesome and um there's just a lot of really wonderful stuff so if you decide to get out and out, out and about let me know but this has been such a pleasure i'm so grateful oh likewise this was fun thanks Good. for thanks for doing this taking the time um yeah thanks again yeah my pleasure have a great night we'll we'll i'll we'll see you soon yeah bye see ya Elizabeth Moen, y'all. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank all of you for listening. ElizabethMoen.com for all things Elizabeth. Make sure to pick up a copy of wherever you are. I'm telling you, it's outstanding and you're going to dig it. Pre-save uh, on your preferred streaming service. The song you're hearing in this episode is a good representation of that wonderful record. It's called Headgear. Um, y'all, I ended up going to that Kevin Morby show the next night at Intuition Aleworks in Jacksonville, Florida and had an absolute blast great venue if you ever see anything on the calendar that's at, at intuition even if you're from out of town i mean i'm not getting paid by the duval county chamber of commerce or anything but um i look you know i love jacksonville you know i have a complicated relationship with it but i love it and intuition aleworks has all kinds of great shows lucero's coming up pretty soon i'm not this is free pub intuition i love y'all um <laughs> lucero's coming up pretty soon um uh mike cooley plays there every once in a while patterson hood's been known to play there so it, just keep an eye on the calendar if you're in florida definitely and it, even if not jacksonville's worth the trip y'all we got the beach we got um plenty of great restaurants the river it's a beautiful beautiful city so uh, check it out if uh if you see anything on the calendar that piques your interest marinadepodcast.com for all things the marinade follow us on instagram and twitter be sure to subscribe on your podcast app so you don't miss an episode and if you really like what we're doing please consider joining our patreon community where for just a few bucks a month you can gain access to patreon exclusive content like our show jason's journey where i talk about the moments that shape my creative life y'all even two dollars a month goes a long way if you can swing it we would greatly appreciate the support we got some wonderful stuff coming your way soon i sat down with isaac gibson of the band 49 winchester last week and garrett t caps just a few days ago both were an absolute delight, and we'll have those episodes up in the next couple of weeks. Y'all, this is our first episode since August, and thank you so much for hanging on with us. Um, it was so nice to take a break. Um, I, I don't know why I needed a break. And Al, I want to shout out Al for pointing out on Twitter the idea that like it doesn't matter why you needed a break. You needed a break. And uh, I just feel reinvigorated. It's not that I was not feeling motivated to make the show. Far from it. I was still enjoying every episode. But something told me, some intuition told me that I needed to, to take a break. And so I did. And uh, I'm really proud of the result of these last three episodes, or these, these forthcoming episodes you're about to hear. 
And we've got some other stuff that we're lining up soon. We're headed down to Orange Blossom Review in uh, in Lake Wales, Florida, and there's a lot of cool stuff going on there. I've reached out to a few folks, um, and uh, I, I try to keep the Patreon community uh, abreast of like who's coming up and, and what's going on with that. So again, uh, f- hop over there to patreon.com slash marinade podcast if you can swing it. But above all, thank you for listening. Thank you for spreading the word about the marinade, y'all. Until next time, go out and create something. Cheers.